Francesca. Thank you very much uh, for, for being here and uh, what a nice, awesome community event to be a part of. Thanks for Mark for getting me out. And um, some, I, I'm assuming, particularly our Italian friends here might not know who I am, but I wear a bunch of hats. I'm a songwriter, uh, I, I tour a lot, I perform. Um, and in recent years, after having kids, I started taking on score work. Um, and so I've worked on a handful of TV shows. And then recently, the thing that has occupied a lot of my time is, a, it's actually, it, I almost don't like using the word tech platform or anything when we're talking about the arts because it feels off, it feels too online or something like that. But it truly is uh, a startup uh, called Side Door. And um, I feel as though I, when I first started performing and touring, um, I would sometimes be asked to perform at people's houses. And uh, at the time, I didn't say no to any gigs ever. Uh, and so I would do it. And I would, I would play in people's living rooms. And what I quickly learned was that the context of a gig is basically as important as the music. So if you see, if you go to a soft seater theater and you are, there's perfect sound and a lights show and you've paid 50 bucks to go see Feist, you know what you're in for. There's, a, there's an expectation, you're listening, you're excited, you've probably been thinking about it for months. Whereas if you wandered into a, a, a noisy Irish pub and in the corner, that exact same singer was there, you'd probably go, oh, she has a nice voice, and then move on. And so I kind of came up with this philosophy about if your footprint cannot be wide, make it deep. Uh, the idea being you play to 30 people in a noisy bar, you might get five of them to remember your name. Whereas if you play to 30 people in a living room, the intimacy can actually, it can change lives, literally. Uh, and those people not only leave with a sense of your music, they leave with a sense of who you are. They're not just invested in your career or your, or your art, they're invested in you as a person because they feel like they got an inner glimpse at what you're doing. And so I, years ago, I had this idea, I was like, man, wouldn't it be cool if there was like a network of these places where you could go and play? And even if you weren't famous, even if you didn't have industry mechanics or buzzy blogs talking about your music, you could kind of go and make a carpenter's sort of uh, living uh, as this sort of like, you know, grassroots touring circuit. Um, and it took many years of, of kind of thinking about it, and finally I met the right person to help me lift it off the ground. But basically the premise is that anywhere is a venue. This room is a venue, your home is a venue, a barn, a cafe, a loft, an art gallery, you know, if you work for the parks board, a park could be a venue. Anything can be a venue um, if it has a motivated host. And so what Side Door does is it sort of matches hosts with artists, kind of like a dating service, you know, swipe right or left, cool music, cool host, boom. Um, and so you have a match and then you make a gig, people buy tickets right in the app, they show up, they say their name, they walk in. So basically, we're, we're basically taking the mechanics of an Uber or an Airbnb and we're trying to change the way that the entertainment business is run. There are so many gatekeepers in the entertainment business. And wouldn't it be cool if just off of your own art and sort of uh, vibrancy, you could go and make a, a career of touring you know, any number of hosts all over the world? That's, that's the goal, that's the, that's the vibe. And so when I think about, you know, I've been spending a lot of time in boardrooms, I've been spending time fundraising, talking to people with lots of money uh, who don't have an entry point into the arts necessarily. And it's got me thinking a lot about, okay, so as the side door grows, how do we maintain, how do you scale intimacy? I mean, that's kind of a ridiculous idea. I wanna scale something that can only be vital, you know. Um, and so we have a deep philosophy about why we're doing it, and, and really it comes down to community and fostering a sense of community through the arts. So if, you know, I, I normally on a touring circuit, I wouldn't play Coquitlam, but if I'm a starting musician, I know, if I know that I can play to 60 people at say some place like Mark's, or sorry, Scott's uh, house, and I know that they're gonna be listening like this, 
and then half of them are going to buy my CD or album afterward, and I'll be talking with them, and then I know that I have a bunch of people in Coquitlam that are going to be talking about my music, and instead of making 30 or $50, which doesn't even pay for the gas, I can make maybe five, six, 700 bucks, because all the money's going... Basically, you're cutting out all the overhead, and you're making it feasible for artists to make a living at the same time as you're creating these one-of-a-kind, unique experiences for, for people. And then people show up to the show, and they're like, oh, didn't I see you at the playground? Oh, yeah, you're so-and-so's, uh, you know, uh, father. And, and, and so then all of a sudden, there's like these little bits of... And you share an experience through art, and then every little community where you can go and play, all these people are closer. And then, you, the, you know, the musician leaves, but all these people now have a shared experience, and that's where the community is born. And I, long ago, I came up with this idea of why do we do art? Um, in my opinion, and it's, it's, I, I can't take full credit, it's sort of gathered from a handful of, of places, but I think when you feel a certain way, Language, social context, conversation, there are all these reasons why we can't convey how we feel. Language fails, social context fails to fully communicate an idea or a feeling. So when you make a sculpture or you write a play or you write a song or you, you dance or whatever it is, however you express yourself, you're sort of throwing a smoke signal way up in the air and you're saying, this is how I feel. And it could be a hundred years later, it could be a million miles away, somebody will see the smoke signal and they'll think, that's exactly how I feel. And so, cosmically, through time or space, you've created, for both people, a slight bit of relief from the existential loneliness that we all feel. And it's really, I mean, that existential loneliness is the most uniting factor that we have in a weird, ironic way. <laughs> So, I believe that art can fill in the gaps where language fails. And so for me, performing, making music, it's, it's about uh, being on stage, uh, or sometimes not on a stage, and trying to get to a place where what's going on is bigger than me, and it's bigger than you guys, and we're all participating together in something that makes us all feel united. It's sort of like you can forget about the ongoing train of thought in your head and just experience something and be in it, let go. And I believe that in those moments where you let go and you're sort of totally unconscious is actually when you are at your most fully conscious. It's like the circle, right? You go all the way to unconscious and boom, you're conscious. It's like a, and I believe in those moments you're your truest, most amazing, honest, version of yourself. And so context. Side door is like a, it's like a tool by which I want to create that context over and over and over again uh, as much as possible um, all over the world. And I, I think that for some people they get it through church, you know, some people they get it through art, some people they get, I don't, you know, I think as long as you have a, a, an output, you have a thing that you can do where you can go to feel a part of something bigger, you can feel humbled that's a very, very, very powerful feeling. We've grown uh, over the past year. Uh, we started out just uh, my friend Laura and I. We have a team of six now in Halifax. Uh, we have an office. We have the whole thing. Uh, we are, uh, it's crazy to think we've, we've built basically a, a ticketing system at this point. And it's funny because we're so focused on the tech platform. And we have to have these check-ins all the time about why are we doing this? What is the purpose of this? Um, and to come back to that community feeling where everybody wins, I think is, that's what we all want to do. And I'm going to do something. Okay, let's kill some existential loneliness. Um, I'm gonna get you guys all singing. And I know that it's not something that you expected to do at nine in the morning. Uh, I was out there making some weird noises because I don't normally sing at nine in the morning either. Um, but um, I think it's to convey exactly kind of what uh, Side Door is trying to do. Uh, it makes sense to do this. So something I've been doing for a while is actually uh, not every time, but sometimes coming into the middle of a crowd because all of a sudden I'm not taller. I'm not... Uh, I'm not on a stage, I'm not pre uh, well lit. And actually, if I could get you guys to stand, mostly so I can steal this chair. I lied, I am, 
I am going to be taller than you, but only, only so you can see me. Um, SFU, how are the chairs? Are they good? Just don't start dancing. That's right. I'll keep it. Um, okay, so I'm going to take this off. Sorry? Dave, you were saying that your child has a fever. If you go over, you both be in the same boat. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, oh man, that was pretty sucks. <laughs> um, luckily, they're over the point where it's 1 a.m. and then 3 a.m. Um, so, this is a song that I wrote a long, long time ago, and for some reason, it sort of has kept in my set, in my catalog for a long time. Um, and there's two little melodies. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,
Dan, would you please join me up, up here? Uh, you guys had the chance to have conversations with, with each other. Now uh, let's have some conversations and uh, questions and listening with our guest, who would like to kick us off with a nice challenging question for Dan. Not too challenging. Not too challenging? Who are you pointing at? Oh, OK. Thanks, Dan. Uh, so in our group, we had a question. You mentioned that you have these check-ins with your team about what is the purpose. And I'm curious how that answer changed from the first time you had that meeting to the last time you had that meeting as you kind of figure out what this platform is for. Yeah, it's interesting how we've sort of ingratiated with what, I guess, the startup community. And we've learned all these words, you know, like <laughs> pivot. And that's where you think it's going to be this. And then it's not. And then it's this. I mean, when, I've, when we first started out, it was like, it's, it was just house concerts, and it was, um, you know, we were going to, like, arrange, like, PAs that you could travel with and all this stuff. And then we just, like, the deeper we got into it, we were like, I don't want to deal with those logistics. And then we've, we started kind of, at the same time, as focusing in on what is the heart of what we're doing. We're just matchmaking. That is it. And we don't want to tell people how to have fun. <clears throat> you know, a, a lecture in a room like this could be a side door event, or a, a punk rock show in an auto body shop could be a side door event, or a rave in a warehouse could be a side door event. And the, the idea is we want to connect the people, but we don't want to tell them have fun. And one of our main things is we don't want to brand it. We, don't, we just want to be the connector, let people brand it and market it however they want, but just let us kind of funnel all the people into the same place. Um, so it does change. It has changed a lot in terms of like, what are we doing? What are we building? Um, and it started out just music, and now it's you know it can be improv or comedy or film screenings or lectures or whatever. Um, <clears throat> but at the heart of it, the thing often, and when you're talking with investors, something I've learned is like, well, why you? You know, like why? Like what? I don't. I don't have any history in tech. I have no coding ability or anything like that. But I have a gut check. I've been touring for. Uh, 13 years, and I know it. Every decision, we go like, okay, well, what if we did like merch, like a, a merch sale thing? And I'm like, mm, that's taking more out of the artist's pocket. You know, like, okay, okay, we won't do that. You know, but like, whatever we, whatever we're doing, I can check it against my own gut and know would that. And I, that, I'm trying to build a platform that would have like just made my life awesome 13 years ago when I was just starting out. I'm trying to, I have this image in my head of like being on tour, uh, you know, and then you like stop at a diner for, at a rest stop or something for, for lunch and you're like flipping through hosts and you'd be like, oh, I just booked a show for tomorrow night, you know, three hours from here or I just booked a show a month, you know, just like constantly going and like leapfrogging gigs and just like, I mean, through, you could just endlessly tour if this all works out. And so I'm trying to build the thing that would be the most helpful to me. <clears throat> and one thing we've realized is that if we stay artist focused, that we will get great artists. And if we have great artists, we'll get great hosts. And the whole platform hinges on hosts. That's that we need great hosts, you know? If we don't have places for them to play, the whole thing fails. Um, and so we need to, at every at every corner, we have to say, is this making the lives of artists better, or is it just another gatekeeping thing taking money out of the artist's pocket? And so we always are balancing that line, and we always have to go to, this is making lives better for artistic people. Hi, Dan. Thanks. Um, I guess I wanted to get back a little bit to the community aspect of what you're doing and what you're talking about. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how important it is to have an explicit and explicitly communicated uh, set of values for any given community versus more of an implicit uh, sort of cultural transmission of those values. Sure. We, I mean, we have, we have certain like guidelines and rules and sort of, uh, what's our wording on the website? And we do have sort of like a policy of like, you know, we are, uh, side door, we assume that, you know, uh, guests will respect the host and, the, and their space and that the host will be inclusive and allow, you know, all kinds of people. We have all these things, but we also, we allow for private shows, you know, like that you, if some people don't want strangers in the house. Some people want as many strangers as possible. So we're trying to cater it so that everyone can get from it what they need. Um, but in terms of guidelines and policies, definitely, just from a liability standpoint, we're trying to figure out how can we set everyone up to win? And so we're, we're doing a lot of educational videos, 
never hosted a house concert? Well, here's Scott, and he's going to walk you through it, you know, and do 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 and you kind of have these, like, videos that they can watch, and just um, daisy chaining the education process of how this works so that people are set up to win, so they don't sign up, host something, feel totally overwhelmed, and not have any kind of understanding of how to handle it and then feel burnt out and never do it again. So we want it to be, the whole point is that it's, it's supposed to feel great. I mean, I've, <clears throat> I've witnessed it. I've witnessed people, uh, I've been to other house concerts or I've played them and you look at the host after and they're just like buzzing because they know that they were the curatorial point that brought all of these people in their community and they hosted it. Like literally they are hosting in the truest form uh, an exchange of values and art and culture and experience. Um, and so we're trying to do everything that we can for people who are a little bit more timid about community engagement to feel like they, that that's okay and that we can help them through the process. Um, but the, I mean, there's all, we, we had one, we've already, you know, we're coming, we're learning a lot. We had one situation where an artist who was a, a, a woman and she was touring alone and uh, once somebody at the merch table, nothing terrible happened, but you know, somebody at the merch table made her feel uncomfortable. And we thought, okay, well, that's, that's a thing. You know, if you're playing in someone's house and you're uh, feeling vulnerable as a, as a person, how do we set everyone up to win? <clears throat> One of the things that, we're, that is crucial to, the, to our system is ratings and testimonials, you know? And we already know it. If, 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 you, had a, if you have a bad, not that you would know in this city, but if you have a bad Uber experience, <laughs> you give them one star. And then like a couple other people give them one star and they're off the system. They can't get back on, they're done. So the idea here, you know, if someone punches a hole in the wall, the host reports them, they're gone, they're done. And then, you know, we figure out how to fix the, ho uh, the hole in the wall. <clears throat> but so far, we have catered, I mean, we're, we're, we're starting with what we know. And what we know is the easiest way to do this is to put an acoustic guitar in a living room. Our scope for scaling is far bigger than that. We want it to sort of serve all kinds of different performance styles in all kinds of different places. Um, but we don't want it to be just folk music in living rooms. Like, and that's, that's a, but so far the, that has been our strength and so we're sort of building from there and, and growing into other types of performances. Um, thus far, to be honest, it has not been an issue. Like, people are respectful. The testimonials we get, we have a, a feedback system, you know, of rating performers, rating hosts, art, hosts rating artists, everyone rating each other and most, most of the time, it's one of our problems is that everyone just gives each other a five out of five. <laughs> so it's, it's almost like how to, you know, which is a good thing. It means that everyone's having a good experience. Um, and uh, so I'm sure as we grow, we will have more issues. Hey, Dan, uh, still glowing one-time house concert host here. I appreciate the, uh, the authenticity and the integrity of your goal. But when you said investors, uh, you realize you're going to have to make some money. And you said you want to not be a gatekeeper, but you have to make money. So you're going to have to take the money from somewhere. And yeah. wouldn't it come from the artists? Well, it comes from, so what we, you, the typical situation in like a venue, <clears throat> so, you know, my, I remember the first time I played the, the media club, I was like first of five bands or something like that. I made $30. There was like maybe 100 people in there. <clears throat> if you, if you, let's say you are the headlining band and the only act at a club like that, and you only get 25, 30 people in the door, you know, you maybe make 50 bucks because you have to pay for the, the venue rental, and you have to, you know, you're, you're, you're subsidizing the venue actually existing. So the premise of our thing is the host, the rent is already paid where the host is. So we're cutting out so much overhead. And what we do is total transparency. When you buy your ticket, you see a pie chart of exactly, it's like when you buy, buy gas, you know, and there's a little pie chart telling you where all the money goes. Um, you see exactly where your money's going. And typically what we do is Sidor takes 10% of, of the ticket, which is like a, you know, in, in the industry, that's like a standard booking fee. And then the artist takes 80% and the host either takes 10%. I would say the majority of our hosts are donating that back to the artist. So you find me any scenario in the entertainment industry where, an, where the actual performer is walking with 90% of the gate and I'll, I'll do a backflip. You know, it just doesn't exist. Um, there's so many, you know, it, it basically artists get paid on the net and we're paying them on the gross. 
Anyone? There we go. Hello. I was wondering if you can just share a little with us. I don't know if it's something so personal. Uh, your creative process, like, it's not about the format, but more about the experience, feelings, things like that. When sure. you're creating a song. Yeah. Um, I get asked, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a question that a lot of journalists ask, and I find that every year my answer changes. Um, but uh, I, find, my, I find that my creative process changed after I had kids, partly because when I was in my 20s, I was a musician, man, and I was just like writing songs all the time. It's like three in the morning, whatever. Um, you know, whenever the muse strikes, go write your songs. Um, and now it's like I have to put it in the iCal, like, okay, between two and four, I'm going to try and write a song <laughs> on Thursday. Uh, but uh, I'm going to have to go pick up the kid from preschool. You know, it's like, um, so it's just simply in terms of music used to be this sort of like, I didn't even think of it as a job. I didn't think of it as work. It was just like this obsession. But now, because when I'm doing music, it means that I'm not with my family, which means that I'm either leaving my wife alone to fend off our two insane boys, <laughs> or, you know, or we're paying for childcare. And, um, and so there, it, there's like a, a slightly more divided line of like, I have to get the most out of every little bit of work I do because it, it's taking me away from, from this thing that is clearly very important to me. Um, <clears throat> but that being said, in terms of my actual songwriting process, I've never been, I, th there's, I think there's two, two kinds of songwriters. And sometimes the Venn diagram overlaps. There is people who pay tribute to the great tradition of songwriting. So I think like a Ron Sexsmith or, um, I'm trying to think of like, uh, you know, I would say most songwriters are in that vein. They are, they are, they've listened to 10 million songs. They understand structure and wordplay, uh, how to convey a metaphor and all these things. And they largely more or less are focusing on love as their primary topic. And so this is, and there's nothing wrong with this. This is, this is a beautiful tradition that has gone back a long time that, that I, I really respect. Then there is the other circle, which is, I have something to say, and if I don't say it, I'm gonna go crazy. So that's like the something to say songwriter. And music is just the medium. Music is just the, 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 the medium of choice by which to communicate that. And I think that that overlaps, you know, in some ways, some people kind of live in between those two worlds. I would say that I'm more of a something to say kind of guy. If you look at my Twitter feed, that would, it's pretty, pretty clear, um, not, a, not shy of opinions. Um, but I feel like uh, the, the spark of a song for me is when I have, I kind of mentioned this earlier, when I have a, a feeling or an opinion or th I'm thinking about some intangible element of existence and then I try to use words to explain it and I can't. And so if I can't draw you an exact photograph of what I'm trying to do, I can use a song to suggest it from about 20 different angles. You know, the verses are doing this and the chorus is doing this and it's all pushing you in this direction to feel a particular way and hopefully you're feeling the way that I'm feeling. Um, so that's, that's the core of my process and I, a lot of my songs are, are very lyrical. Um, I, don't, <laughs> I don't do very well when it comes to TV and film because, you know, most of my songs are like, I kind of love you, but in a backhanded way, and it's really screwed up. So, um, you know, or boy, wouldn't it be great if we didn't burn books anymore? Uh, but you know, it's like I like the songs that get placed in TV and film are like "I'm with you" or "Let's do this" or you know. So, anyways, um, I'm a very wordy writer, and I I try and infuse. Another, another ace up my sleeve is I have this total pension, and it's, it's bit me in the ass before, to try and infuse as many clunky words into a song as possible. There's, this, uh, there's a, a line in one of my songs that says, dogs need ample time outside. And the most scathing review I got in my whole life <laughs> was of a gig at the Horseshoe Tavern in Toronto in maybe 2010. And it was crazy, it was sold out. It was like my first big, Toronto blowout show after having worked my way. I played like 20 shows in Toronto in tiny little bars and cafes, and this was it. 
And it was amazing. It was like the most exciting night of my life. And, um, and I'd had a really good year. I, you know, I'd, a lot of things had gone my way that year. And the, the title of the review of that show was the, uh, the Indie Music Emperor Wears No Clothes. Basically saying that I was full of shit. <laughs> and that he had just, with the reviewer, I don't know if he had a bad day, but he did not like the show. And he thought that I was just full of hot air and that all the buzz was, was totally unfounded. It's funny thing is I've since been interviewed by him. <laughs> Neither of us have mentioned that review. Uh, <laughs> But uh, anyways, uh, and, but his, the, 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 the like climax of his scathing review of this show was like, ample just isn't a songwriter's word. <laughs> and so my response internally is, fuck you. <laughs> so I have since put in my, uh, like the, actually the song that has charted the high, maybe the highest for me ever on the radio, I managed to, right in the middle of the chorus, I put the word evidently. <laughs> And it's like, I just love, it's like, I just, it's, it's all pointing back to this chip on my shoulder. <laughs> well, I think we're out of time, so we're going to leave it evidently, evidently there, having had ample time. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I have a... Thank you. Thank you. Dan Mangan. Thanks, Mark.